Now, an overview of neuron signal sending process. At rest, before any signal is received, the axon or the cell has a negative charge and the dendrites receive signal in the form of neurotransmitters attending, attaching to its receptors. And in response to the signal, positive ions, sodium or Na+, they flow into the cell. This decreases the voltage and makes it less negative. This is called depolarization. If the, decreases, if the decrease in voltage is enough, the threshold is crossed, resulting in an action potential. Basically, action potential is the electrical signal that occurs when the inside of the cell has a sufficiently large positive charge. And the depolarization and the resulting action potential, they trigger additional action potentials nearby. And as this goes on, the signal is being transferred. And pr please take a reference to the figure to the right. After a signal is sent, the cell needs time to pump out the sodium ions so for a short while it cannot transmit any signals. This is called the refractory period. And at the axon, the electrical signal called the action potential, they cause the synaptic vesicles to release neurotransmitters. The ne neurotransmitters then cross the synaptic gap and reach the receptors of the receiving neuron called the postsynaptic neuron, transmitting the signals to the next neuron. And after the neurotransmitters do their jobs and are released by the receptors, the axon collects them again, and this process is called reuptake. And some important facts that are often tested are the ions relevant to this reaction are the sodium Na+ and potassium K+ ions. And at rest, the axon on the cell has a negative charge, and the action potential only occurs when the threshold is crossed. For example, the cell becomes positive enough due to influx of positive sodium ions. So this is how it all works. Neuron stimulation causes a brief change in electrical charge. If strong enough, this produces depolarization and an action potential. And this depolarization produces another action potential a little farther along the axon. Gates in this neighboring area now open and charged sodium ions rush in. A pump in the cell membrane, the sodium-potassium pump, transports the sodium ions back out of the cell. And as the action potential continues speedily down the axon, the first section has now completely recharged. And the direction of action potential is towards the axon terminals. Now, more about neurotransmitters. Some drugs can act like neurotransmitters. For instance, morphine, which is an OP painkiller, can bind to the same receptors as endorphins. Endorphins are our body's natural painkillers when they are released when we exercise and make us feel good and feel less pain. When drugs or other molecules attach themselves to receptors, we have special names for them. Agonists, they are molecules that attach to a receptor and stimulate the response, for example, morphine. On the other hand, there are something called antagonists, which are, which are molecules that attach to a receptor and block the response. For example, some poisons bind to receptors that ACH are supposed to bind to. As a result, your muscles cannot move and they receive no signals and thus you become paralyzed. This is basically how Botox, Botulin, works. Another example is Curare, a South American poison. Now, please take a look at this image. I'll take a few seconds for you to take notes. On a side note, agonist and antagonists. Career poisoning paralyzes its victims by blocking ACH receptors involved in muscle movements. Morphine mimics endorphin actions, which is an agonist, and which is an antagonist. This is a question, guys. You may freely answer it within your um, classrooms or within your um, desks and yeah you may freely explore which is the agonist and which is the antagonist the answer morphine is an agonist and and the other is the antagonist which is our I will, I will not say the answer. You may figure it out for yourselves.
So the receptor site on the receiving neuron is right here, right, on the left. And the neurotransmitter opens the receptor site. And the agonist mimics the neurotransmitter opening the receptor site. And the antagonist blocks the neurotransmitter from opening <coughs> receptor sites. And neurotransmitters, they carry a message from a sending neuron across a synapse to receptor sites on a receiving neuron. Now check the table below for important neurotransmitters and their functions. Be sure to memorize this. ACH, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine are particularly important. They're going to ask you about them in MCQs and alpha keys quite frequently. Now acetylcholine, the ACH, their function is to enable muscle action, learning, and memory. Examples of malfunctions are with Alzheimer's disease, the ACH producing neurons deteriorate. So if you have a lack of acetylcholine, then you get Alzheimer's. Dopamine, their function is to influence movement, learning, attention, and emotion. Now oversupply can be linked to schizophrenia, undersupply linked to tremors and decreased mobility in Parkinson's disease. This is really important too, a frequently, frequently asked question in MCQs. Serotonin's um, function is to affect mood, hunger, sleep, and arousal. Another supply linked to depression. Some antidepressant drugs, they raise serotonin levels so that your level of depression may alleviate. Norepinephrine, they help control alertness and arousal. And under supply can depress your mood. GABA, called the gamma aminobutyric acid, it's a major inhibitory neurotransmitter. The undersupply linked to seizures, tremors, and insomnia. Glutamate is a major excitatory neurotransmitter which is involved in memory. The oversupply can overstimulate the brain, producing migraines or seizures, which is why some people avoid MSG monosodium glutamate in food. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Psychology is related to life. Now on to module 10, the nervous system. The nervous system is a system of communication system consisting of neurons. It is fast, it is an electrochemical communication system, and there are two parts, peripheral and central nervous systems. The central nervous system, CNS, they consist of the brain and the spinal cord. And the peripheral nervous system, called the PNS, they are sensory and motor neurons that connected the CNS to the rest of the body and nerves, which are bundled axons that form neural cables. They connect the CNS with muscles, glands, and sense organs. And sensory afferent neurons are neurons that carry information from sensory organs to the CNS. And motor efferent neurons, with an E, are neurons that carry information from CNS to muscles and glands. And interneurons, they are neurons in brain and the spinal cord that communicates internally and intervenes between sensory inputs and motor outputs. And the peripheral nervous system, called the PNS, they also consist of two systems. The somatic, which controls voluntary movement of skeletal muscle, and the autonomic system, which controls the auto automatic and the self-regulate action of internal organs and glands. Now the sympathetic arousing aka flight or fight response, they arouse the body and makes it use more energy. They dilate the pupils more light into eyes and higher heart rates, a higher blood pressure and a higher blood sugar to your liver. And they also induce less digestion in the stomach and a release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is related to adrenal glands. And the bladder relaxes and you have less desire to urinate. So like when you're facing a scary bear, you need to pretend that you're dead, right? Or to flee in order to escape the situation. You don't want to pee in front of a really scary bear that is chasing you, right? And also stimulates ejaculation because you're kind of nervous. Now this is the fight, or fight response. So when you're aroused due to a threat, you have to either fight like a man, like a macho, or run away. Now, I really recommend you to run away when you're facing a scary bear or like a really um, scary zombie or a ghost rather than fight with them like a man because you're gonna die like a man with honor. However, you're still gonna die. So please run away and live. 
in order to watch Liam's AP Psychology video and get a 5 on your AP Psychology exam. So, coming back to our lecture, the parasympathetic system is about calming. It calms the body and makes it use less energy. It also contracts pupils and it gives less light into the eyes. It lowers the heart rate, it lowers the blood pressure, it lowers the blood sugar level, and induces more digestion and your bladder contracts. Finally, now you can pee and you get more blood flow to sex organs. Now, the central nervous system, CNS, again, they consist of the brain and the spinal cord. It's about thinking, brain, feeling, brain, and acting spinal cord. Around 40 billion neurons and 400 trillion synapses are in this nervous system. Now, there's something called the neural networks. It's about how groups of neurons that do similar things like cities of neurons are existing. And different neurons work together in these groups to create output. You know, reflex are simple automatic response to sensory stimuluses. An example is a knee jerk response. So when somebody slams their fist into your knee, your knee naturally kind of pops up. It kind of jumps up, right? And that is a reflex. How this works is how is about how um, sensory information is sent to the spinal cord and the interneurons in the spinal cord, they process information and then the motor neurons, they send information to muscles. Movement is faster and automatic because it never reaches the brain. Now, neurons network with nearby neurons. Encoded in these networks is your own enduring identity as a musician, an athlete, a devoted friend or a lover and your sense of self that extends across the ears. How neural networks organize themselves into complex circuits capable of learning, feeling, and thinking remains one of the great scientific mysteries. How does biology <coughs> give birth to mind? Now, <coughs> as esteemed AP Psychology students, you may be the ones that are going to be able to find the answer because I'm also curious. And the comment section of our YouTube channel you may type answers if you know the answer to this really interesting question. And neurons in the brain, they connect with one another to form networks. The inputs, there's something like lessons, practice, master classes, music camps, um, time spent with musical friends, and outputs can be something like beautiful music. That's how band works, right? Uh, you work with esteemed musicians, with esteemed um, song composers, that's how great musics are made. And the brain learns by modifying certain connections in response to feedback. So that's how specific skills develop. <clears throat> now on to the endocrine system. The endocrine system is slow and chemical com communications with hormones, chemical, which are released through glands happen. The hormones, they are chemical messengers that are manufactured by endocrine glands. They travel through the bloodstream and affects other tissues. <coughs> now, the endocrine system, they consist of the hypothalamus, which is the brain region controlling the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland, they secrete many different hormones, some of which affect other glands. And the thyroid gland, they affect metabolism. And parathyroids, they help regulate the level of calcium in the blood. And adrenal glands, they, that is the inner part that helps trigger the fight or flight response. And the pancreas, they regulate the level of sugar in the blood. And testes, they secretes the male sex hormones. And the ovary, it secretes the female sex hormones. Some hormones are identical to neurotransmitters and shows how the nervous system and endocrine systems are connected. Comparing the nervous and endocrine systems, the nervous system is really fast, but the endocrine system is slow but is still longer lasting. Example, when we're angry or excited, the adrenal glands they release epinephrine and norepinephrine, also known as the adrenaline and noradrenaline. <clears throat> when we get a higher heart rate, higher blood pressure, and higher blood sugar as a result. Even when we are away from the source of excitement, these effects linger on for a while. So when you're really angry or something, when you fought with a friend or when you broke up with your lover, it kind of lasts on, right? It kind of lingers on, even if that situation has ended. It kind of still remains within your mind and kind of haunts you. That's because 
that's because you get a higher heart rate, a higher blood pressure, and it leads to a slow but a longer lasting effect because it's about the endocrine system. It's kind of related, it's in the endocrine system. That's an effect. <clears throat> now, we're going to talk about the pituitary gland. It is the most influential gland. It's controlled by the hypothalamus. It regulates the growth and controls other endocrine glands. It releases growth hormone and oxytocin, which is about bonding, group cohesion, and social trust. It also releases hormone to regulate other glands. It also triggers hormones that stimulate sex glands to produce sex hormones. It triggers hormones to stimulate adrenal glands. Now the feedback system, um, it starts with the brain from the hypothalamus section and then goes on to the pituitary gland and other glands, hormones, and body and brain response.